chapter will be divided into several parts. In the first, I just very briefly repeat what uh, David had um, uh, mentioned, simply for the sake of giving you a bit of a flavor of different phase diagrams and what you can do. I touch on a few more typical systems with different interactions, but then I will um, go on to explain two very nice uh, techniques that uh, one of them I worked with in the past, and that allows you to directly measure the interactions between hard spheres or colloidal spheres um, very accurately, and that's with the surface force apparatus, and um, actually it's down here, and then I will also touch on a bit of rheology, and in particular micro-rheology, that's something that is really upcoming and interesting um, for systems that are where you have very little material, because maybe it's too expensive or very rare, or it is very fragile also. And you will see why, why this could be interesting. Okay. Now, um, how to construct a phase diagram? We, you first need some free, free energy um, for a set of um, um, parameters, temperature, volume, and um, number of particles in your system. This could be written here. Here is your, in the, in, in, in the Boltzmann factor, you have <coughs> in your, your, sorry, your interaction potential here. And then you have to make a good guess of your potential energy or interaction energy. So if you have a Van der Waals interaction, then you get an expression for the free energy. And I don't go into detail because you all know it all very well, I'm sure. But what is important is to construct your um, isotherms, in a, for instance, in a PV uh, phase diagram. And for each temperature here, we have just one phase. And once you start to have here this, um, this uh, plateau, this uh, is where you start to have phase separation, critical point, and you go down, and then you have to, uh, you get... These, the, this, this wiggle here, and you have to make the Maxwell construction with equal surfaces here. They must be equal, and that gives you the equilibrium um, um, phases of your two systems. Now, you all know also by now that uh, a condition for f uh, equilibrium is that the chemical potential, the global chemical potential, has to be the same in all in, in, in the entire system, so constant everywhere. And that's just the um, partial derivative of the free energy with respect to the number of particles for <coughs> sorry <coughs> in the same uh, in the system at constant uh, pressure and constant um, temperature. Now you can then plot your um, free energy, and the most easy thing is to do a double tangent construction, and that means you put a tension into these, uh, along this uh, free energy curve, and they have to um, meet here. Now, incidentally, if you have a minimum, they don't necessarily, ha the double tangent doesn't necessarily have to hit exactly the minimum of each local minimum here, but it has to fulfill the condition that it uh, touches both uh, minima somewhere such that uh, this condition, equilibrium condition, that the chemical potential is everywhere the same, is fulfilled. So you get these two points, which, uh, say in this case, are your two coexisting uh, or points on the um, binodal curve. So you get uh, these points, and people can measure it for various systems. In the past, uh, during my master's, I did some measurements like that, where I made mixtures of polymer A and B and let them into diffuse, and then I get uh, at given temperatures, and you can reconstruct the entire phase diagram, which is quite a lot of work. I'm, experimentally, you really have to work very hard to get a good map of that. Okay. <coughs> 
Now, um, oh yeah, this is um, just um, to what uh, David got lots and lots of uh, questions on spinodal and, um, and binodal. When you quench your system, hap you happen to prepare your system up there and you quench it down here into the spinodal region, what happens is your second derivative of the free energy becomes negative and that cannot be, and it's uh, unstable. And you get um, a separation, phase separation, where, where your fluctuations become larger and larger, your density fluctuations or composition fluctuations become microscopically large, and you have this type of phase separation, whereas in the nucleation and growth regime, you have this condition, and what happens is um, you start, you have an overall system, and you start to nucleate some, some little nuclei, and if they are grow we heard a lot about that but from David, if they are gro large enough, they will grow. Okay. <clears throat> now, what is also important is now how to uh, represent phase diagrams, and believe me, going through the literature, you will find many, many articles with a phase diagram that is either incomplete or completely incorrect because people very often don't understand what, how to construct or how to represent a phase diagram uh, correctly. It is Im one important thing is that it is at equilibrium. So even if you have some steady state system, a steady state system is not necessarily an equilibrium state. You, you pump in energy. But the energy in equilibrium is conserved. So that's an important thing. And I showed you, I show you this typical phase diagram that is taught in all undergraduate um, courses, and we saw something similar. For water, this line would slant back a little bit, accounting for this anomaly of water at freezing, that it expands rather than collapses. But um, this phase diagram can, be also can also be represented in a different way. So if instead of uh, pr plotting it as pressure over temperature, you can also do that um, uh, pressure over the volume in your system, and then you get a different representation. And that shows you more also that you have coexisting phases in, in the system. So these lines in this system become uh, surfaces and the critical point here is just the maximum of this uh, surface between, if we, this is um, volume, here is gas, um, here is the solid phase, here is liquid plus solid interacting with each other, and uh, uh, solid and gas here, and liquid and gas here. So you, uh, and this is the tri-critical point. So it's important to know what you want to represent and where you are in the phase diagram. And this is something that remains notoriously difficult for experimentalists if you look for something interesting. Many uh, students go through that and hate their advisors for being made to map out points all over the system because it takes time. It t really takes a lot of time. Um, and it's after you measure one point, it's exciting. Two points, less exciting. The tenth point, hundred points, is really off-putting. Another night in the lab. Okay. So, effect of different types of interactions. Now, we have seen the hard spheres, and uh, again, you will see uh, this type of... Um, Phase diagram, although Richard just in, uh, pointed out, you can get a more complex phase diagram even with ha hard spheres if you don't plot that uh, against temperature, but if you implement pressures. But believe me, to do pressure experiments, phase diagrams for varying pressures is rather hard for colloidal systems. It's, it's, it's not an easy, easily controlled system. So it's much easier to control the temperature. Okay, we saw that you can get these nice FCC crystals, and again, we saw these. But now, introduce, when we introduce 
um, a little attraction like in the argon system where we describe them to first approximation with a Leonard Jones potential, then we get these, this type of phase diagram, which is much more complex than the hard sphere um, phase diagram. Here I have the temperature plotted versus uh, the volume fraction of, your, of the uh, colloid in the system. And now, um, there are, you can play with the range of the interaction and the width of the interaction. And by doing so, you can go from something like this with a simple Leonard Jones system to something more complex like that. And people have shown that if you take, for instance, hard sphere colloids, they are very monodispersed. And it's in theory and in simulations that it has been shown. But um, then you take a depletant uh, agent that is only 1% in size of the big spheres. And they're also very small. So you have an extremely narrow attraction and a very deep, but very deep one, then you can get some, some more complex phase diagrams where you have liquid-liquid but also solid-solid uh, phase separation with uh, exotic structures that have not been yet observed and uh, analyzed in experiments. They have been simulated, but um, it is difficult to achieve them. Now, at this point, as an experimentalist, I would also like to um, warn you about even though you get this nice equilibrium phase diagram from simulations, when you do experiments in occasion sometimes it is also that you are hindered by slow dynamics and slow dynamics can prevent the system to attain what we call thermodynamic equilibrium so although you know that you should get something, you will not never get it because it is so strongly retarded that um, it, um, it will never get, it has to overcome too many high activation barriers in the system. Now, um, another important thing is uh, sample preparation and history. History, when you take a sample and you, you heat it up and you cool it down and you heat it up again and you cool it down, it can do something to your system. And that's very crucial. The th thing that I showed you with the pleuronics without salt, just in water, is very nice. When I add a lot of salt, when I, I introduce different type of interactions, and as a consequence, I get a very rich phase diagram. But when I do the cycle up and down, every time I get a different point. And that's very frustrating. What is then the real phase diagram? And... So uh, this can be very important. You can bring, when you bring it into a high um, temperature region, you can bring it into an irreversible state and don't come back. So you have to know what you're doing to your sample. And you have to keep track of the exact um, preparation method you use. Also, which I not go into, but um, when you, who knows about Uzo here? One person, two persons, three. Ouzo is a, um, a very uh, popular Greek drink which uh, contains aniseed oil, ethanol, and water. It's, it's a three-component system, which is a fairly... It's not a colloidal system, but it's initially a one-component system when you buy it. When you buy it, it's a clear completely transparent uh, liquid. In France, they use, uh, use uh, Pernod or Pastis, which is uh, Ricard. Um, that's a different um, uh, brand, but it's the same idea. It's transparent when you buy it. You take a little bit and you pour in water. You quench it into the two-phase region. What happens is you start to um, nucleate little droplets of aniseed oil in your solution. And that's why it turns actually cloudy. It's completely white when you do that. And now when you happen to prepare your exactly the same sample by first mixing water and ethanol in the same comp composition, and then you add the oil, you will never get that. It stays macroscopically phase-separated. So this is a very drastic way of showing that 
the way you prepare your sample, you go different pathways in the energy landscape to your equilibrium. And if you prepare it in the wrong way, you will never get there. So it's very important that you know what, how to prepare it and why some things work and some others don't. You have to try it from different ways. So you get very nice cloudy uh, samples when you take the water, the right one phase region, and you pour in water. That's al that always works. And you get monodispersed droplets in the system that simply grow only due to um, osmotic, uh, uh, no, uh, Oswald ripening. Okay. Um, another important thing is this depletion I told you. Uh, now, I wanted to give you there um, a different um, example where depletion plays a role in biology. Um, that's a very nice one, and that's um, called um, stacking of, uh, of red blood cells, or also known as rouleau formation. Now, red blood cells are, in principle, also colloids. But they are donut-shaped, so a bit flat disks uh, to first approximations, to first approximation. And in the past, many doctors, when they in, um, checked you out, they also took some blood from you and did some sedimentation experiments. Um, they uh, uh, determined the sedimentation rate of your red blood, blood cells in the system. And just for one reason, if you have an infection in your system, even if you don't know, you can have already an infection, you start producing fibrinogen and other materials, other polymers, and they add as depleting agents. And what happens is, when you look careful, these are little stacks of red blood cells that have been stacked together due to depletion forces, because when you have an infection, you produce more of this protein or of this um, polymer in your blood cell, and these rouleaux are much larger, they will sediment quicker. So you can detect a little infection in your body already just looking at the sedimentation of, of, your, red, uh, of your red blood cells. So that's a very nice by-the-side experiment. But uh, they are important, and many people, very often in more complex systems, people forget of, about these uh, depletion forces. You have to always think, uh, uh, remember, keep them in mind. Okay, now um, over the past uh, five, six years, people have come up with also very uh, pretty other constructs, uh, basically computer machined, uh, computer made uh, patchy colloids, and they are very interesting because people like to think of proteins also as type of patchy colloids. And people started, uh, like uh, the group of Francesco Shortino, Emanuela Saccarelli and others, uh, to take spherical colloids that are as such hard spheres, but they attach very small, very strongly sticking points to them. So you can have either two or three or four and so forth. You can play with the symmetry and then look at their phase diagram. So if you have just... Ooh, So if you have just um, two st uh, sticking points at high temperatures, sorry that it's in green, this is at uh, um, uh, a relative temperature at point one, then you see that these are forming a gas. You go down in temperature, T is equal 0 0.055. They start to form these nice... Um, warm-like chains here, and this is all at a volume fraction of 0.35%. Um, so it's low volume fraction. So you can start on forming uh, these chains, but not really networks yet. You start introducing more points, you have a large, uh, you, you can get nice networks, and a two-phase separation in the system, but this two-phase separation region in your, um, in your uh, phase diagram decreases as you decrease the number of sticky points. So you have M equals 5, 
m equals 4, but we have seen that already before. Sorry? Okay. Another very in, uh, pretty example that um, Francis Starr and um, Francesco um, Schottino were working with is taking very small colloids, you don't see them here, and attach exactly four single-stranded DNA uh, to them such that they can interact. And the idea behind it is that many system in, systems in um, nature, like water, silica, carbon, are tetragonal um, systems. They, form, uh, they are four, uh, have four bonds, and they form highly uh, a, a, a zoo of different type of uh, structures. So they looked at it, but what is interesting, they would like to have wanted to get a, a diamond-like structure for this. When you cool it down, they bind, you heat it up, they unbind and become a, a, a liquid. But the structure of, of the gel, and I call it a gel, because they never get a diamond-like structure. And that's simply because you have introduced also here some flexibility. You don't have fixed bond order, like, uh, like in a rigid... Uh, atom where it is fixed and not, not so flexible. So this, this was actually quite nice and Francesco asked us to, to make this sample, uh, this, that uh, samples, but it turns out not to be easy. First of all, to measure something like that, a, a real gel, you need a lot of material. Now DNA in small quantities is okay to buy. To have a lot you have to either do it in your own uh, lab, amplifying it with uh, uh, PCR, but it's, it's, it's tough. And then also to make sure that you have really only uh, four uh, DNA uh, strands attached to that is very hard to this colloid. So n what we do at the moment is to use holiday junctions, which are really giving you four bonded uh, things, and then play with that and see whether we get these nice uh, structures. But here you play with a number of sticky points. You can also devise different type of DNA junctions with only three, uh, a three-way junction. And you may get a completely different type of network. What is shown here is, looks like sort of tetrahedral aggregates of genus-like particles, and each of them has one DNA attached. Is, is that how you try to synthesize? I mean, first of all, is that correct? I mean, is that what no. you're saying? Uh, the building unit, a single building unit here, hmm. is a, a small colloid that is uh, behind these red dots. Okay. And to these, you have four, four arms attached. This yeah. is your starting building unit. What, what are the red blobs? This here. Yeah, uh, I don't know. This is something that uh, gives uh, that um, is in the simulation simply an attachment point. So this is f for them. This is fixed, but the red blobs allow a little flexibility. So the the, the you have um, a point, and you have four arms mm -hmm. of single-stranded DNA, but they are not four stars. Um, Rigid, they are not rigid tetrahedras, but they are actually a little, they have a lot of flexibility in this, that they can rotate and, uh, and, um, and move around. But if you did use genus particles, that's one route to having greater control or not? It could be, yes. I think what, when I, what we try to do is to take um, these colloids and bind them to a surface through specific interactions, and then add to the system free other dif DNA that binds to the unbound thing, then you, uh, which is much stronger. Then you heat it up, it comes off, and then you have two different sides of uh, DNA with different uh, sticking energies, binding energies. You have formed genus particles. A bit like, uh, like what... Uh, what um, what, what uh, Steve Granick uh, showed. Yeah. But it's not easy. And again, with DNA, playing with DNA, you play with little quantities. Uh, to make large quantities, yeah. it's hard. Uh, it costs, and, and they degrade with time. So you have to right. 
re replenish that constantly. No, no, but just in terms of controlling coordination number, I, gu I guess it's relatively easier to sort of figure out how to attach one DNA to one bead. Yes. All of them, right? You can do that. So once you do that, then sort of having these guys come together to form a tetrahedron. Yes. Maybe a... But, but the second question I have is, um, if the average coordination number is four, instead of everything strictly being four, does that change the behavior too significantly or you'll still get roughly the same behavior? Um, is that known? I mean, either in simulation or in experiment. I mean, you see that from, um, from the simulations from the patchy particles that when you ma mix, say, two and three, you change this region, the phase separation region. So, um, but if you have a whole zoo of these, you know, if I have a mixture of many between two, three, and four, then, then the boundaries of this, your phase boundaries become more diffuse. So that, that's a problem. So you, to in, the interpretation of your results become a little problematic. Okay, now, so uh, we've been looking at a model which is not patchy, but uh, what we control is the average coordination number. Yeah. And it's not uniformly coordinated. Mm -hmm. So there's an average number that changes with temperature, etc. But there is no problem. I mean, the, as long as okay. the, the, the... So when we tune the interaction in a direction which reduces the coordination number, we get the same trend as, as what you showed okay. with the Bianchi et al. work. Yeah. Um, so... I don't think there's any problem with the phase behavior if the coordination number is controlled on average rather than strictly for each particle. That's, that's very good because, um, you see, uh, f as an experimentalist, I cannot compare to the true case. Uh, and that's why, actually, it's very useful to, to, to interact with people like you and doing simulations and look at what happens if, if you introduce the variations uh, that you just mentioned, but um, so what the idea is what we are at the moment doing are doing is we we make a system, we try to understand a certain um, parameter system, and then we ask uh, the group of Dan Frankel, to who happens to be not too far from us, can you please simulate uh, the wider phase diagram for parameter range for us? Because we don't know in which direction we have to go to get something interesting or all the time the same. So that's, that's very important. And that's why I think uh, m m my group is uh, more and more involved also doing simulations. Yep. Sorry? Depletion? Uh, here's no depletion. How different these nucleation and aggregation processes are? Um, well, here what you have is um, you don't have um, aggregate. I mean, nucleation is such that um, because of the st strong, attractive, short-range interaction in the system, you will have not nucleation in the sense of, uh, you know, that you can necessarily um, supercool your system and wait or supersaturate your system and wait until they start to bind because it's fairly fast, uh, the aggregation. So you, you may, that's why you have more a disordered uh, structure than, say, something that is nicely growing, uh, nucleating, and then growing in, in a nice crystal. So you will have many spots where they start to um, uh, bind. And once they bind, it's not a critical nucleus. They just are there. You have a whole... Um, a, a, within a short time, a, a large array of different um, patches that are bound, 
where maybe two, three, five, six uh, different um, subunits or building blocks, and they are growing, and then they hit each other and, and, and merge together. So, so the ordering is the only parameter which uh, distinguish between. Ordering is the only criteria which distinguish between nucleation and aggregation. Yes, I th well, to my uh, to poor experimentalist uh, ideas, uh, aggregation is you know is a generic term, and in general, I think you would say it very it, it implies um, also disorder. Whereas uh, nucleation is very often uh, um, associated with ordered structure also, which um, is not necessarily um, an aggreg uh, aggregation you also uh, associate very often with uh, strong binding systems. So if you form, for instance, a um, xerogel, you know, particles move around, they just hit and they stick and they don't move. Then you get a amorphous structure um, that's more aggregation t to my opinion but it's 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 a very you know I would be very careful in saying oh this is an aggregate and this is a crystal when I see something that is clearly crystalline I will always try to call it a crystal uh, just to make this, this distinction that aggregate can be anything you know including ordered, including ordered aggregates but you have to be careful when it's crystalline or when it's ordered then I call it a crystal otherwise um, I would be careful it can be any aggregate can be disordered or whatever uh, excuse me ma'am can you comment on the probability oh, yeah. can you comment on the probability of uh, reproducing the simulation sorry in a real <coughs> can you comment on the probability of reproducing the stimulation uh, sorry, simulation in a real experimental condition because in a colloidal state, uh, if you have a colloidal system with a distribution of charges around it, uh, they, they, it is not very, uh, it is not possible to attach a strand of single or double strand of DNA, DNA at a particular point of the colloidal system. Uh, um, is it it, this here, the simulation ha is fairly reproducible. I, I'm pretty sure that. Francesco and Francis, uh, Francis made sure that they ran long equilibration uh, runs. And uh, now it is uh, f so. For instance, when you do an experiment with uh, col nanocolloids with uh, single strands on both sides, and then you just move it, what you typically do to make sure that you really have the appropriate hybridization between two single strands is you move, you, you heat it just below the um, melt temperature of, the, of that strand. And everything, it is true that you could have only two ends binding locally with two bonds instead of the full thing together. These will come off because they have a lower uh, melt temperature. So you cycle that up and down a few times and typically three times and what you get as a resulting cluster, that's, that's actually fairly good. Then you um, have eliminated anything that is only partially bound or basically you anneal your system. Yeah. By that way, uh, we are reducing the uh, formation of monolayer around the uh, spherical colloidal systems or something like that. Uh, because uh, the the problem is that if you are uh, introducing a collateral system into a uh, single standard DNA thing, uh, it will form the possibility of uh, attaching is very much less, uh, attaching in specific sites is very much lesser than the probability of providing a monolayer around this spherical system. So what do, what you, do you mean with monolayer? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Look, can I, can I suggest that it looks like a complicated question? Uh, why don't you just catch Erika after the lecture? Okay. Uh, sure, sure, sir. I'm here until uh, Friday morning, so. <laughs> okay, um, that it, something experimental actually works, and I told you in last week's lecture that it's not so easy because you're binding, uh, the, the, the binding um, isotherm or 
not isotherm, that's wrong to say, the hybridization cur curve becomes very sharp when you attach um, many single strands to, say, a gold nanoparticles, um, to a gold nanoparticle, it uh, was much more difficult to get something ordered. So that's what, they, uh, what uh, two groups achieved only two years ago, that of uh, Park, Merkin, and all, et al., and the group of um, Oleg Gang. And um, what is interesting is um, that uh, they introduced some spaces, elastic, spa uh, um, flexible spaces to the single-stranded DNA that otherwise don't do anything. It only gives these strands a little extra flexibility in order to get the appropriate binding in the contact area. And um, they have also some polymeric, additional polymeric uh, spaces. And then they wiggle their, temp uh, their system or their anneal their system very closely around that melt temperature. And what was initially, what they got initially as a disordered structure after some time ends up in an FCC and under other appropriate uh, situation with different linkers, you get also a BCC structure, which had been then verified with a small angle X-ray scattering. And, uh, but, but these are, structures are still not perfect in terms of using photonic crystals because there are lots and lots of defects and also many empty spaces. So they are locally these crystalline structures, but the overall aggregate can contain a lot of holes and be rather imperfect as such. So it, 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 is, it is not an easy um, thing to do. So people have really uh, played with it. But just very recently, actually, I spoke to Oleg Gang, and they introduced some additional spacer here that can be changed as you change then the temperature or you, you put in some new... Uh, replacing spaces, so you build the crystal, and then you add new spaces that like even better to bind, that are a little longer, and you can then make your crystal actually expand quite a, lo quite a lot. So you have <laughs> built a crystal structure, you add longer spaces to them, and the whole crystal expands in place. Now that's actually quite interesting, but it, it's certainly very difficult uh, experiments. Yeah. Sorry? This plot? Please, please wait for the mic or, or shout. Can you please explain the plot in this figure? So this here, what you have is something very similar to what I showed you with the, my pleuronic uh, micellar crystals. So they took the sample and looked at, with a small angle x-ray scattering. So this would be, um, in small angle x-ray scattering, you can always plot it in, um, on a flat screen because it's all, much is in small angles uh, scattered. And then you get uh, a powder crystalline uh, rings, and these rings, the, the, the segment, or this is integrated here, um, shows you that you have... The broad thing, the sharp things are your Bragg peaks of local crystals that are indicated by the red arrows here. There are little dots, there are higher intensities. These are growing crystals, whereas you still have lots of uh, liquid contribution of diffusely moving um, colloids in the system. So you have a combination of both your, your crystal, local crystal structure plus some liquid structure of the, um, of the unbound colloids in the system yet, or that are not prop appropriately bound. Yes, that would be here. This is plotted as Q over Q0. So Q0 would be this here. Um, but uh, what, what type of Bragg peaks? It depends on what you want to see. Well, when you... 
Yes, you could look into the smaller Q region, but then you get information on larger structures. So that could be, for instance, the size of your crystals. So, so the, 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 the smaller you go, the closer you go in here, you, you sample larger and larger structures in your system. If there is none, then this is more or less flat. If, if, there is, if you start to have large, larger and larger aggregates, or so you can get some, some, some more information here. But, uh, and, and also other things that I don't want to go into. But uh, at the moment, this is good enough. They only looked here at specifically the lattice spacing between these um, colloids in the, in the crystal. Yeah? So this reflects the lattice spacing here in the reciprocal room. Uh, excuse me? Mm -hmm. uh, here. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Yeah, you actually almost answered my question there, but uh, just a, a minor uh, uh, point. So uh, can you, uh, like for instance, if you have a polycrystalline uh, sample, like uh, for instance you had even in your the, the, the earlier data that you showed with the tri-block copolymers also. Yes. Uh, so can you accurately uh, get uh, something like the grain size out from uh, SACS uh, measurements? Well, so depending on, say, the width of the peaks that you get and so on and so that's forth. That's true. You can get from the width of the peaks some idea of, uh, because they're inversely proportional, I think, to the si uh, grain size as well. Mm. Yes, you can do that. I don't know how good the resolution is. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't have done anything from that for my uh, soft crystals because there already the um, contrast is very little. Okay. So... The, the actual uh, sort of resolution will be rather poor, I think, I would think. It's much better for, for solid samples. There you get much more accurate uh, peak widths. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So what I want to do in the remaining time is uh, completely go away from... Um, from these type of, ex of experiments and uh, uh, examples of uh, different types of interactions, but uh, also show you a little bit more in detail um, point, um, two systems that I used to work with, that I used to work with, surface force apparatus. Many people uh, we heard about uh, work with uh, confocal uh, microscopy. Be aware, confocal microscopy, you only can work with that when you have at least objects of about one micron in size. If you want to go uh, smaller, you will not be able to resolve it very well unless you somehow f uh, fluorescently label only the core and look at the core distribution. But it's, uh, you, ha you are diffraction limited um, with visible light. Um, small angle X-ray scattering, I touched a little bit upon that. As I say, take your laser pointer, take any nice different type of fabric or any sample, point at it, and see whether there is any structure on micron scale. You will easily see that. Um, there are met many other small techniques that I hardly dare to mention, but when you have asymmetric systems that are asymmetric building units that are, in, um, that are as such in solution transparent, a way of getting a first idea of what structure there is, you just take two cross polarizers under a microscope and look at uh, your liquid crystalline texture can tell you something about the order in the system, whether you have a, a nematic order or a discotic order. These are all sorts of little things that you can use in the lab to construct a phase diagram. But there are just very easy, the, the, these are the cheap, uh, quick tests that you can do in the lab. If you want to more, have more quantitative results, uh, you need to do things like uh, small angle x-ray scattering for dimensions that are smaller. And also sometimes when you have something that is opaque, that is also a limitation. If you have colloids in the system that are not refractive index matched, you can't look inside. And then you need to have something, some other experimental method, for instance, x-rays. Now, 
rheology and microbiology give you more an idea of uh, dynamics in the system, but also a bit of elasticity, and through elasticity also something on the structure. So I will explain these two things in blue. And the first thing is the surface force apparatus. It has been developed in the table labs uh, during the PhD time of uh, Jacob Israelashvili, who is now in Santa Barbara, writing on his, working on his third edition of his book. And it's a book, very, a very nice book to, to consult when thinking about uh, trying to learn about the surface forces. And the idea, the, the basic idea in the system is that you have two s mica surfaces um, that are your sample surfaces in the system. They are silvered from the back side here, and you have white light, parallel white light, going through these sample systems. The micas are um, Y mica, this is a clay, uh, but you can cleave it on very large scale and get large facets that are absolutely the same thickness. So if you have two equally thick surfaces um, that you can put on both sides, that will help you to measure exactly or very accurately the um, separation between the two sample surfaces, which you use to measure surface forces. For, furthermore, mica is atomically smooth when you cleave it. So it's very clean, it is very smooth, you're not hampered by any uh, roughness in the system. Now, you just pass that through a, a microscope objective prism and the slit, and then you do um, the, the white light that goes through here, you resolve in a spectro uh, spectrometer, and you get fringes, what we call fringes of equal chromatic order. And I explain to you in a moment what that means. That, that is how we uh, measure the distance, and we use that also for force measurements. Now, these two sheets uh, are uh, attached to cylindrical um, glass lenses. They are aligned in cross-cylindrical um, way in, a, in order to make sure that you have only a point contact, because you, at these separations that we measure, we measure the se separation to, down to plus minus one angstrom, you cannot align parallel plates to that separation. So we use this uh, point contact here that is very, very clean. Okay, so this is uh, the heart of the experiments. These lenses are uh, then attached to a couple of, uh, the top lenses uh, attached to a piezo, which we, we, we can measure the exact um, um, separation or control the separation. The lower one is uh, attached to a more rough um, cantilever spring, and we basically measure atomic forces with a macroscopic cantilever spring. Of, so that, that's the beauty of the thing. So you measure directly some very small forces using a macroscopic um, yeah, spring that you measure to measure any type of forces. So the idea is that you, when you're far away, you have this cantilever spring, here's your uh, surface, you move it a known distance, and then you move it another uh, known distance, say you apply a voltage, and you measure the separation between each motion f corresponding to some, some voltage here. When it comes close and it feels some interactions, this will change, so the spring will bend, and it is the change in uh, this here that is no longer the same as your, your calibration uh, run, and you can measure directly, or you can translate that into forces. Now, so it's, the physics or is, is very uh, trivial. Uh, normal forces, we have a fixed st a stiffness of the spring, which is about 70 newtons per meter, and um, the f normal forces are then as a function of the separation, just the spring constant times this change in, um, in the motion delta D zero minus delta D. And what is important, what comes out from the, the reagent approximation, if you plot the normal force over the radius of your big 
cylinder, which is a cylindrical surface, so it's uh, maybe one, mi uh, one centimeter, this is directly 2 pi, the interaction energy per unit area between two flat plates. So we use that, we measure forces, but by normalizing it over this radius, we get the interaction energy directly. So that's important. What is also nice with this is, I didn't show it in the cartoon, you can also bring the surfaces to a fixed separation and then move the top surface and measure with another set of uh, springs that are perpendicular. We can measure very accurately the friction between top and lower surface. So we can also do some uh, microrheology in, if, in a sense, but also friction measurements um, in this uh, um, setup very accurately. Again, there the spring constant is variable in, this, uh, in Jacob Klein's uh, apparatus, and that's between um, 100 newton uh, per meter uh, and more. So the um, uh, force resolution that you can obtain is plus minus 0.1 micronewton. Again, this is again between two atomically flat surfaces. Any questions on that? That's so easy. Um, now, the beauty also is, and that's also a difference to a typical AFM measurement, which is commercially much easier available and uh, perhaps also cheaper, is uh, that you measure the separation between your two flat surfaces very accurately. And the idea is what I told you before, we use white light. And although we measure plus minus one angstrom and very small gaps, we still can use visible light of a few hundred uh, nanometers to re resolve very small changes here. And the idea is that you take these mica surfaces, you silver them very thinly uh, with a very thin layer such that only, uh, that only say, 1% of the light passes through or a bit more. Um, you see already the plasmonic color when you silver it. When you look through it, it looks completely blue. That, that's a very nice um, check that it's not too thick. And when they are in contact... You have a one-layer interferometer, and only standing waves can pass through that. Now, remember that uh, I don't have flat surfaces, but two curved surfaces. So instead of seeing then the, the fringes that are observable, the light that comes through, are not flat lines in your, in your spectrometer, but they are curved lines. Because as it curves here, the distance here on the sides becomes larger and larger, so they move in a spherical uh, way, and only in the tip is where your closest approach is. So you know exactly where you are. When you move apart, then um, uh, to a separation D, you have a three-layer uh, interferometer. You can uh, work out what the odd fringes, uh, dependence of the odd order and even order fringes are that pass through. And this is the order of the fringe the wavelength uh, um, of that order divided the refractive index only of mica. So that's very beautiful. So it also is independent of the refractive index of your material in between. So that's nice. If you, have, if you choose to measure the uh, even fringes, then also um, the refractive index of, of your medium comes in, uh, of your uh, solvent here comes into play. And in this case, um, you can even uh, obtain the change of refractive index in the system. If you, for instance, have polymer layers and then you compress them, it ch weakly changes the um, refractive index depending on the concentration of the polymer in there. So you can do several things there. This is a typical picture that I spent a lot of time in my, during my PhD to look at in the dark room because you have to do the whole thing in, in the dark. And this is when you are in adhesive contact and you see this, this is your contact area and that's in air. So it flattens out because the glue below is a bit soft so you don't have just a tip but you have a very nice flat area and the flatness and the clean cleanliness of that tells you also that you have a really truly
clean surface. That's also how you calibrate your system, uh, zero contact. You bring them out of contact, say let's look at this fringe, and then you move it out and they become curved. So this point, the most left uh, part, is the point of closest contact. From that you can get very accurate measures to plus minus one ang angstrom. So, Jacob Israelishvili and many others uh, in the 80s have already uh, measured very fine uh, DLVO forces using exactly this machine. So you can really verify also the geometric uh, dependence of um, the uh, Van der Waals forces uh, when you come close and measure the Van der Waals forces very accurately between them uh, for f completely f smooth flat layers not containing anything here and you can do that across a solvent in air it's very hard because you have lots of vibrations but uh, and then people have measured that as a function of just polyelectrolyte solution but what we did was to look at uh, say what happens when I have a polymer brush on the surface now um, Alexander uh, Schlomo Alexander and uh, De Gen, um worked out some nice theory and the free energy of um, or the energy that you measure between um, two flat surfaces with a monolayer of brushes in a good solvent between the two uh, surfaces is given by two important uh, factors. One is the osmotic repulsion term. It means far apart when they don't touch, they, you don't measure anything, but when you start to compress, you in increase the monomer-monomer density, and that leads to an increased osmotic pressure that scales as 1 over d to the power 9 quarters, uh, minus you gain energy when you compress the stretched brushes because they are entropically elastic, uh, 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 entropic elasticity, they are stretched, when you compress them, you unstretch them, you gain some energy, but this term is stronger. So I'll show you a force, typical force profile. The equilibrium height of these can be easily measured and is given by the um, um, segment, uh, number of segments of the polymer times the typical inter-anchor spacing between the polymers times the segment length to the power of five thirds. So let's go to some experiments that I uh, did some more than 10 years ago by now. And that's a typical measurement that you can do. What you see is, again, I plot the force as a, over the uh, divided the radius, which is the interaction energy between these two surfaces. And now this, uh, what I uh, prepared is a polystyrene in toluene. Uh, the polystyrene has a molecular weight of 370 um, um, uh, grams and it is, sits in toluene. It's a good solvent, so in principle the polystyrene will not absorb in this con under this condition to the mica surfaces. But I have a little sticky end unit which uh, has a sticky energy of um, say 4 to 6 uh, kT it's a switzerlandic group that will strongly attach to the surface. And what you obtain is a stretched brush regime on both sides in equilibrium. And when I now start to measure, do the first force profile, I start from far away when they don't feel each other and I move slowly together. And then as I move together, I start to see some forces. So let's say this compression is this dark uh, squares and I compress, compress, and I get pure repulsion. And you see that the repulsion is really abrupt, stopping here, and at this point, that's where two times your equilibrium brush height ends. But even though you have uh, elastic gain of uh, elastic energy, the repulsive osmotic, uh, the osmotic repulsion will be much stronger, and you have just pure repulsions. And so you see that you use polymer brushes as a repulsive um, barrier for or stabilizing uh, material for colloids on the whole. 
Now, what is also nice is they are reversible. So you, if you decompress, you retrace more or less exactly the same system. So you don't have any uh, hysteresis, force hysteresis in the system. Accidentally, we also looked at depletion. That is, we had first prepared our uh, solutions, and then we add free polymers, the same polymer, without the sticky end group. And actually, it's, not, it's on a log-log plot, and we see actually a, a compression of the brushes by um, a little bit of um, 10 to 20 percent, depending on the length. But, um, but we don't ha see any significant attraction in this system when we use um, when we are in well in the though we are well in the um, overlap regime or a, a, a semi dilute regime. Yes. Can you give him some mic? Over there. In the experimental setup that you showed earlier, I thought you were measuring the force between the two uh, parallel plates. Yes. Is it correct? Well, not two parallel plates. As I said, uh, in principle, I have two cylindrical objects, uh, two cylindrical uh, surfaces, the mica surfaces. I glue them on cylindrical lenses. So you have one parallel line in the maximum of this. But then I have a second one that I align in a cross to it, such that I only have a point contact. Because if I don't, if I try to align them in this way, it's impossible at this separation to make it perfect. And then you, you, you always measure at this, and then you don't measure the correct forces. I correct for that by dividing the force that I measure uh, with the radius of my two cylindrical objects. So my question is that then how are you extracting the uh, information about the force between the polymers? Um, yeah, that's um, going ba back to this. What, what you do is um, you measure this uh, distance with your um, optical method. But now Let's say um, I have a power supply moving this here in a certain way. And I apply a, a voltage and I move a known distance. I know there is no force involved in the system, right? So I establish what uh, I, I move, uh, I apply a little power, uh, 0.1 volt, it's moving and moving or uh, to my piezo. And I ha establish basically a baseline relating that motion. Uh, the distance has to be um, the same as I approach the, uh, the, the sur surface. So equal um, pulses have to give me equal, uh, electric pulses have to give me equal distances. Now when you come closer, I measure a change in that jump of my fringe that is different. It's no longer the same as this, what I call D0, which is established in the baseline. I measure plenty of these far out. And it is this here, the force that you measure then, is just simply your spring constant times this change. Yeah? So you, you know exactly although you, you measure basically distance, but also at the same time the force independently. Yeah? And then I just divide by this uh, radius, which is one centimeter of my lens. So that's, uh, that's why it's, it's very simple, very easy. Okay. So we can measure these type of interactions very accurately. And... Um, and, and we, we can look at the interactions as we change um, the solvent properties. We can measure, if I, if I shorten that, then the onset will be lower. And um, I can play also with the quality. And there are lots and lots of experiments done where you have weakly adsorbing polymers. And actually weakly adsorbing polymers without very strong sticky end group, 
can you be used for coagulating because a weakly adsorbing polymer can both attach to one colloid and an opposing colloid, pulling them like a bridge together. So to, for stabilization, you better have something like, like a brush and a good solvent. Yes? Uh, does it depend on, on the load rate? Uh... No, I, I tried that. You can uh, do that um, quite slowly. Uh, we did many, many profiles and three or four different people measured on two different machines. It's fairly robust. Of course, um, it is only limited. You can't go very, very fast because then you have mechanical strains and sluggishness of your system. But, but that's actually fairly fast with the piezo. You can move very f nicely forth and back. You can also hold it in compression. You can hold it here for a long time, an hour, and then move out. You retrace the same measurement, uh, the same thing. It's different when you have um, telecalic polymers that have two sticky ends because then they can attach here and they can form uh, bridges. Then you get attraction. And then it depends on the loading rate. But in this case, it's just clean, like uh, predicted by a theory by Alexander Dujan, very um, reversible, no hysteresis, very little dis or quasi no dependence on loading rate. And uh, what happens when uh, you separ the, the plates? What happens if? When you uh, try to uh, separ, uh, to put... Uh, away the two plates when you go in the, the, the opposite direction he wants to know what happens when you separate the plates Super. Yeah, this is uh, what I mean I, I can hold it here now, these are comp oh, the sorry. black ones are yeah, compression sorry. so I, I bring them together okay. and the empty squares are decompression measurements so I, I take them apart okay. thank you that's, that's, that's no hysteresis you do see hysteresis with different systems that, as I said, if you have weakly absorbing surfaces, even if you prepare them far apart so that br no bridges can form, then you will see hysteresis because then you bring it in and out, no hysteresis if you do it quickly. If you bring it in, leave it a moment, then they have time to form bridges, then you will see attraction. So you can do a whole set of uh, experiments that have been done using stabilization, different type of stabilization. But you can also play with the temperature of the solvent. You can bring it into theta solvent and then, or into bad solvent, and then this one will be much more collapsed and they may show you a different um, profile. They can also show you weak local attraction. So you can play with uh, very, uh, uh, various um, ways. Now, why, why the surface forces? And I mean, at that time, the AFM was, uh, when it was uh, first functional, uh, I think it was Jacob Israelishvili did his, this, built it during his PhD, and he defended in 71. At that time, AFM was not around yet, but it was a very good way of measuring the um, um, DLVO theory. Now, the advantage of an AFM still is that it is independent and it has this absolute um, distance measurement. In AFM, very often, you can also make force profiles just in the same way, and you have a, a probing tip or colloid on the cantilever. The problem is you, it's much harder to know what the absolute separation is. You may have a relative measurement, you measure the forces as a function of a relative separation, but you don't know really where you are in, in your absolute separation. That's why the SFA in this respect is still very uh, favorable. But it, I can tell you, if you want to do it, leave it to somebody else. It's really tough, and it's very sensitive to contamination, and it's not advisable for young PhD students. <laughs> yes, you had a question? No? Okay. Now, um, so um, you have this uh, 
One big disadvantage of uh, using uh, a surface force apparatus, of course, you gain the advantage of uh, measuring absolute uh, separations, but you are limited to mica. People try to overcome that, and it's not so easy to change the morphology of mica and have still the nice optical interferometer uh, properties. So that's uh, a severe limitation. Okay. Now, um, this brings me to the last part of my um, lectures, and that's uh, rheology. Now, rheology, rheos comes from uh, flow, uh, so it's the study of uh, how things flow. But um, there are two, you can distinguish between two types of um, rheology. One is called uh, the transient rheology, and that's typically done where you want to see the response of your, of your uh, complex fluid or a simple fluid to a, shearing, uh, to a shearing motion. And what you get from that is simply a, um, you can measure the viscosity, you can look whether your system is shear thinning or shear thickening. Most of you had battled with uh, filled uh, ketchup bottles. Um, it's a very sh uh, shear thinning sample. First, nothing happens, and you shake a bit too hard, and the stress makes it thin, and the whole thing shoots out, and you have a huge blob of ketchup all over. Mayonnaise is another very nice uh, um, shear thinning sample, whereas liquid crystals are a nice example for shear thickening um, um, systems, fluids, or uh, a colloidal system, quasi-colloidal system, is uh, cornstarch in water is highly shear thickening. Go to, uh, to, to um, YouTube, put in cornstarch, you get the most amazing pictures, jumping, you can walk on myasena uh, solution. They are hard if you hit them hard. They behave like a hard uh, material, but yet they flow. This is where you look uh, um, in continuous or transient shearing flow. But you can also run a rheometer in oscillatory mode. And that's uh, where people get something more about the equilibrium structure of your system. So what you have to be careful about is when you run that, that your oscillatory, you want to look at how your system responds to a small stimulus, like in the shearing amplitude, at different frequencies. But you, what you have to make sure is that you apply the appropriate amplitude, that it's not too large, you don't want to destroy it, so you have to be in the linear or elastic regime to, do, to get some um, interesting uh, 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 elastic equilibrium properties. So, Yes, my uh, group has also a classic bulk rheometer, and that's very nice and very useful, works very good. But classic bulk rheometry uh, works with huge um, amounts of materials. For each uh, charge, you need a few milliliters. When you talk about biological systems or more uh, expensive colloidal systems, you don't do that. It's very uh, tricky, very expensive also. And so... What we do is now to do, go over to microreology, and that's wonderful. And we don't use the surface force apparatus for that, <laughs> uh, but uh, a very different way. Now, micro, the starting point for all microreology studies, in a way, is the generalized Stokes-Einstein um, relation. And this is written now here in terms of a, as a Laplace transform of the time-dependent diffusion coefficient of a sphere of radius r. So this is the diffusion coefficient, the radius, and this is uh, the, last, uh, the, the parameter s here for in the Laplace transform. This is the diffusion coefficient is proportional to the thermal energy divided 6 pi, the viscosity of your system, uh, times r times s. Now, Again, the viscosity here is a Laplace transform of the time-dependent viscosity. And what is important to, uh, to know is this viscosity is related to the shear modulus, the complex shear modulus, 
G through this relation S times viscosity. Now, um, there are different ways of uh, computing that, uh, but experimentally, what do we, uh, how do we do that? Now, you take your sample. Now, this is, again, limited to transparent, non-adsorbing samples. Uh, and you take a probe colloid, typically of one micron, silica bead, say silica bead in water. And, um, and this um, is held in solution. This will be, if it's free in, in solution, it will just diffuse all around. But what you do then is you take a highly focused um, laser beam, monochromatic laser beam, and you trap it in the focus because the focus acts simply like, um, like an uh, elastic harmonic spring. That's important. And um, you w trap it weakly, and what you then do is you monitor, for instance, with a camera or with a quadrant detector here, um, the fluctuations of that in, X and y, in the X and Y plane. So that's the heart of what, uh, what we call a one-beat micro-rheometer. Uh, there are also other techniques um, um, developed by Dave Waits and others and Mason, and, but this is what we are working with, and it's a very nice technique. So what you do is you measure these fluctuations, and you, uh, in time, you Fourier transform it to get... Um, the correlations to get the power spectral density. So this is a typical uh, picture of, of such a beat. Unfortunately, I, I couldn't make the movie uh, to work, but if you are interested, I can show you later. And these are the fluctuations, for instance, in x direction. Actually, if you measure the fluctuation in x and y direction in an isotropic system, that's a good control to check that your laser focus is really spherical. You have to make sure that this is really uh, symmetric and not ellipsoid, ellipsoidal, because then you get um, not so nice results. But then, traditionally, what you do is you get this power spectral density, and this is related to the imaginary part of the susceptibility of your system, your response function of the system, um, uh, alpha of omega, and while uh, this uh, complex shear modulus is related to the susceptibility of the system through 6 pi r alpha omega. Now, um, it is not so easy uh, to... to uh, um, to extract then the, the viscoelastic properties, but what you do is you take to get then uh, the um, um, the comp uh, the the uh, the um, imaginary part of um, alpha of your response function is then simply one can show that this is just omega over four pi k t times this power spectral power spectral density. Now. Um, would you also want, so you, you, you measure that, that imaginary part. You also need to know the, uh, uh, the real part in order to get the elastic part in, in your system, which is related to what we call in rheology G prime. And that is traditionally done by the group uh, that has been developed by the group of Christoph Schmidt and other people. Um, alpha prime then can be obtained from that via this Kramer's chronic transforms using this rather complex um, expression. Now, one caution about that, I mean, people start to devise different methods to do that. What ha this implies that um, when you measure a time trace, um, these are millions and millions of data points. To obtain then G prime, G prime and G double prime from, uh, from these alpha prime and alpha double prime, they are related in, this, in these two relations to, to the storage and the loss modulus, is that um, you measure a certain time, the fluctuations. It's a huge data set. To obtain these results, you need an offline analysis method to run the Kramers-Kronig. Moreover, the limitations there are 
that uh, you don't measure infinite time. Whereas the Kramer's chronic relations imply that you, ha you integrate, you have a Fourier transform going from mi minus infinity to plus infinity. So you have to f come up with cunning um, truncation um, treatment to, uh, to, to, get, to obtain uh, the appropriate G prime, G double prime, which then actually limits um, your, although your uh, quadrant detector can measure fluctuations up to megahertz, you only get to uh, 10 to 5, but not even higher. And then you see that it, it falls off, especially G double prime, and it has problems. Also, you don't get to very, very low frequencies. You typically measure to, point, to 1 hertz or 0.1 hertz, but slow systems you can't measure. And you always measure, uh, analyze offline. At the moment, we are just about to publish a new um, analysis method where you can also, uh, do that online by not going through Karamas Chronic, but just measure the uh, velocity fluctuations and imply a Laplace transform where you can make, sh uh, may, uh, where, you can show, uh, where you can show that they go to zero. And then we uh, also use um, um, at, high uh, at, at long times. And we can show them, we imply also a um, coarse graining algorithm. And then you can measure G prime, G double prime on the screen appearing before you as you measure your fluctuations continuously. And you can measure as long as it takes until you get a good uh, system. Here, you're limited by the data set, and you don't know a priori when you do the measurements whether it's good enough. But that's at least giving you the idea. So what you do is you have the, uh, your colloidal bead in the system, and it is fluctuating. The fluctuations are related to the viscoelastic property, properties of surrounding medium and you get uh, learn something about that. So just to show you an, a small example where we used that, uh, exactly that approximation together with uh, Daniel Bonn and um, Christoph Schmidt back in Amsterdam and Fre uh, Fred McIntosh, and that is uh, looking at the microrheology of strongly aging gels of laponite. So laponite, we have heard uh, before, I showed you before, and there was also a post on that, uh, is a, a charged clay, negatively charged on the surface, and weakly positively charged on the rims. And even at low concentrations in water, what, what happens is, as you prepare the sample, it is initially completely fluid, and then you wait, and after a time, it's completely gelled. And microreology turns out to be perfect to, to understand what, the real, uh, what, what is happening. So what I show you first is a number of um, power spectral densities of, of our traces, and the black squares here are water, and these, this is a Lorentzian, what you expect for a Newtonian fluid to be completely flat, uh, nicely, monotonously um, decreasing. And the open squares are 30 min uh, 34 minutes after preparation of your sample, and it still is more or less like water because we only have like 0.8 weight percent. It's almost nothing in a, so in, in 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 a six millimolar sodium chloride solution. Now, what happens is as we as time progresses, you see that there is a strong strong deviation of of your uh, power spectral density. Now, as, so we age in time. Now, how does this reflect in the elastic and uh, in the storage and loss modulus, G prime and G double prime, is very nicely. So, again, after 35 minutes, this is G prime. So this is the elastic um, response part um, to your complex shear modulus. There's perhaps already something growing there shouldn't be anything for water because there, water has no elastic part as such at, at these frequencies. You see between 10 to 4 and, and roughly 1, um, one um, hertz. But as we in wait, this is increasing more and more. 
and becomes really a pronounced elastic plateau for different uh, frequencies. And this is as uh, and this is just due to the gelation of our um, colloids in solution. Now, at the same time, when we look at uh, the uh, liquid part, this is not changing all that much. Now, I must say, um, I will not show you um, uh, the results we obtained for what uh, Daniel, Daniel Bond calls a glass, but for no salt and a higher laponite concentration, we have similar uh, solidification times. That means you start out and it solidifies after a certain, say, few hours. You get different, uh, a completely different uh, result here and here. And what we argue is that um, um, a gel structure is uh, in this, uh, these, these systems can form gels in the presence of salt and low concentration of, uh, prote uh, of, of these clays, but they form a glass rather than a gel in um, uh, the salt-free uh, situation on, in, the, in, the right <coughs> sorry, in the right concentration regime. But this is um, very detailed, and I, uh, I think that would be too much uh, to go into detail here. But if you have any questions, just ask me later. But then uh, this brings me to my conclusions, actually, that, um, yeah, colloids, what can I say? I'm fascinated by them. I, I really like them. I eat them. <laughs> and um, so they give rise to various phases, each representing different physical properties. I didn't only very briefly mentioned patchy colloids. You can think of, um, of, of uh, some proteins as patchy colloids that can aggregate, for instance, like this beta-lactoglobulin and pH2 into these nice uh, ribbons here or rod-like structures. But uh, they also can be uh, useful to understand quite a lot of phenomena, like the structural colors. Uh, and to get structural colors, you don't need spher not, not necessarily spherical colloids. Here in this here, you have little long tiles that give rise to this um, str uh, colors. But what is important is the, wave, uh, the, the range of scale that it is in a, um, a few hundred nanometer scale. And there are building blocks simply for new materials and a lot of uh, interesting, exciting fundamental science as well. Okay, thanks. Oh, my, my colloidal fish. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Microbiology, so... Uh, what is... I think so you can... I was putting beads inside a cell, and I thought that different parts of the cell had different properties, uh, yeah. how accurately can I measure that? Now, um, one thing that, I, uh, that we are at the moment trying to do is uh, looking at, um, at um, the surface rheology of, uh, of uh, gel surfaces uh, in solution, and then you just know that you may have different pore sizes of your gels. And indeed, if your pore size is larger than your bead size, then you, see, you expect to see large inhomogeneities. So one thing that you may, the way to overcome this is to do multiple particle tracking and do correlations between these to get then to, to integrate out uh, through the correlations of the motions of the two beads, the, interact, uh, the, the local surrounding, and then you only measure what is in between and, you, and with this, hopefully, people try to get some more insight on, on these strongly heterogeneous structures, yes. But you have to be very careful. You have to know something about your mesh size. Okay, all right. Uh, let's thank Erika again. Um.